I set out to write my story. Crusader for justice. I am Dr. B. Wells. My life has been a challenge many times along the way, but my Christian faith has kept me. I was born July 16, 1862 in the slavery to James and Lizzie Whale, Holly Springs, Mississippi. You see, my father, he was a slave too, being born from a mother, Peggy, and his slave master father, Mr. James Wells. My mother Lizzie, her life was not as easy as my father. You see, my father, being the son, was treated better, but he was still a slave. My mother was born in Virginia, one of 11 children sold several times before Mr. Bolin in Holly Springs bought her because she was a good cook. <laughs> it was there, Spire Bolin, that my father, his father, the plantation owner and master, wanted him to have a skill. So he sent him to live with Spire Bolin to learn carpentry. And it was there he met my mother. Now, it was illegal for slaves to marry. But slave marriages meant more slaves. So Mr. Bolin arranged for them to marry. Now, several issues impacted my life. 1850, cotton was king, and slave labor, it was cheap. And the question of outlawing it, oh, that was out of the question. So in 1860, Abe Lincoln was elected president and the rich white slave owners feared that slavery would be abolished. So the South formed the Confederate States and ceded from the Union. And 15 months later, war broke out. Well, in 1863, President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. In 1865, the Civil War ends. And from 1865 to 1877 was Reconstruction of the South. Almost four million freed slaves. Hmm. They didn't have any skills. So President Lincoln told them to stay calm, work, for the plantation and get an honest wage. And so they did. Now, during this time, of course, the South, they were not happy with what was going on with slavery. So they created from 1865 to 1866, the Black Codes. What was the Black Codes? They changed the name from former slaves to freedmen. It defined the rights and duties of the freedmen. Well, the 14th Amendment had made the slaves citizens. Life, liberty, and property. And then the 15th Amendment 
in 1870 gave every man, woman, no matter their race, the right to vote. Well, once again, it didn't turn out so great for the South. During this time, my father was allowed to vote an old man spiring. He wanted to tell my father how to vote. Well, my father refused. And soon we moved off the plantation into a home. And my father being a carpenter, self-sufficient to take care of the family. Now the Episcopal Methodist Freedman Society, Methodist Episcopal, as we call them, as colored folks would get them sometime mixed up, they came and started schools for the colored children. We attended Shaw University. They had elementary, secondary, and some college. Me being the oldest, it was expected of me by my father to learn to read, write, and other because I started taking college courses and to come home and to read for him. Well, you see, my father could not read or write, but he knew the importance of an education, and he wanted that for us. In 1878... The yellow fever epidemic took over the South. I was visiting with my grandmother, Peggy, in Tipper, not far from Holly Springs, when word came a mother and father and my baby brother, Stanley, had died. I was orphaned at 16. I knew then I had to get back, but my grandmother, she pleaded with me not to go, but I did. There were no passenger trains, so I took the freight train, the caboose, back to Bowling Springs. The good people of the town were there, taking care of my brothers and sisters, but I knew I had to keep my family together. But you see, my sister Eugenia had a curved spine, and there was no place for her to go but to the poor house. So I knew my papa and mother wanted me to keep my family together. So I told the good people, I'll to find a job as a teacher. I don't. I had to find a job as a teacher. I put my age up to 18 and found a job in a country school right outside of Bowling Spring. You see, back then you didn't need too much education, but I knew enough. And I went to that country school. I stayed with the family during the week. And on the weekends, I would catch a mule cart back, back home. And my mother, my grandmother, Peggy, would be there helping with the washing and the cleaning and getting ready for the rest of the week. In 1883, I had more education. And so I moved to Memphis. I took a job outside of Memphis and Shelby County. And I began riding the Chesapeake, Ohio Railroad back and forth to work. Now, mind you, the Civil Rights Act of 1875 said that an individual could not be denied on the basis of race, any accommodations, transportation, hotel, or anything. However, I took that teaching job in Shelby 1883, shortly after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled unconstitutional. 
and that individuals and private companies could infringe and interfere with a person's civil rights. Well, I'll tell you what happened. I would take the Chesapeake train back and forth to Shelby to my school and this is what happened. As was a custom, I would purchase a first class ticket every morning. Well, I did it as usual. <laughs> I had my first class ticket for the ladies car and went in proceeded to sit down and I started reading <laughs> well the conductor came by asked for my ticket he refused to take it I didn't think much of it and I continued reading well he came back with three no he came back the first time by himself it was about a little bit after 8.30. Madam, you're going to have to move from this car. I said, I'm not moving. I bought a first class ticket. Well, he proceeded to take my arm. I took my teeth and bit into the back of his head. He let out a scream. But I went back to read and I knew that wasn't the end of him. He comes back with other men and they remove me to the smoking car. And then at the next stop, they put me off. And I stood there crying and holding my first class ticket. I knew. This was not right. And Reverend County, who was then the editor of The Living Way, had said, Ida, write about what you've done on that train ride in my paper. So I began writing for The Living Way under the pen name Iola. Well, I also decided I was going to sue the Chesapeake train. And I did. I got a black attorney, he sold me out. So I got a white man, he took my case on and we won. We had a judge who was a union soldier <laughs> from the North, $500. Well, the Chesapeake Railroad was not happy and the Memphis paper wrote, Darky Damsel wins damages. That was the first time my name appeared in print, but it would not be the last. Well, I began writing about what was happening. Common sense, plain ideas in the living way. And why write in two syllables when one syllable would do? Because I knew my people did not have much education. Well, it was not long after that, the Chesapeake Railroad, they took me back to court. I went to the Tennessee Supreme Court and they ruled against me. $500 plus damages. I was so outdone. I said, Lord, is there any justice for us? Well, I found a job teaching in the Memphis school system. It was there I found the inadequacies of the colored schools. Sometimes I had 60 children in a classroom and the moral character of those other teachers. I said, I was gonna write about that too. Well, being in Memphis, I met all sorts of educated colored people. One of those was Reverend Nightingale. He was a pastor of Bill Street Baptist Church, the largest church of colored folks in Memphis. And he encouraged me to write for the free speech and headlight. 
That started my real writing career. I was editor and writer. And two years later, I became the owner. <laughs> it was there I began speaking out against the Memphis School Board. How can you allow this to happen? Fix the children in a classroom? No adequate books? And the teachers going around dancing on the weekend? I put that article together and I asked Reverend Nettingale, would you please sign it? He said, I'm not signing my name. But it's for the children. No, Ida, I'm not signing my name. So I signed my own name. And that summer, they didn't renew my contract. I found myself the editor of the free speech. And this was the beginning of my career as a journalist. <laughs> I set aside going all across the counties of Tennessee, getting subscriptions. By the end of the summer, I had over a thousand subscriptions. Enough money than what I was making as a teacher. <laughs> yes, that was the beginning of my career. But what really made me speak out against the injustice was my good friend, Thomas Moss. He was a postal man, and he would tell me what was going on around town. He said, Ida, I'm going to open up a grocery store. He and his friend, Kevin McDowell, they put their money together and put together to have a grocery store called the People's Grocery Store in the Curve, located in Memphis. Now the colored people, we could shop at our own stores and have right done by us when it came to having fresh fruits and vegetables. But Mr. William Barrett, who was the owner of the white grocery store, he saw his business shrinking and he didn't like it. So one day he and an armed mob went to the people's grocery store. A fight took place and shots were heard and the three men, the owners of the people's grocery store were arrested in jail. And three days later, a mob dragged them out of the jail to the Chesapeake Rails yard shot them, beat them. I was in New York speaking when I got the word. I knew then injustices would not be tolerated and I wrote what would become the Southern Horrors I believe the Negro folk of Memphis after the lynching of Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Henry Stewart. There must be an exodus. The Moss crime was opening a successful grocery store that took business away from a white grocer across the street. No attempt was made to punish the murders whose identities were known. Memphis has demonstrated that neither character nor standing avails the Negro if he dares to protect himself outside. We are outnumbered without arms. There is only one thing we can do. Leave.
a finer and cleaner man than he never walked the streets of Memphis. The colored people feel that every white man in Memphis who consented in this death is as guilty as those who fired the guns and ended his life. Entire churches left Memphis. Over 2,000 Negroes left. And businesses that depended upon the colored patronage began to fail. This was not an isolated event. Later on, two months later, the white newspaper called for revenge for who wrote this outlandish, despicable editorial in the free speech. Well, you see, I did not sign my name. They retaliated. They burned my office, my press, threatening letters for me not to come home to Memphis. I was in exile in New York. There, I would continue my fight for anti-lynching. I began writing for the New York Age Press, Mr. Fortune, and the kind women, the colored women's clubs of New York City embraced me, encouraged me, and took on my fight. And they took up donations, which I used to publish Southern horrors, lynch law in all its phases. And my benefactor and friend, Frederick Douglass, wrote the introductory. Dear Miss Wells, let me give you thanks for your faithful paper on the lynch abomination now generally practiced against colored people in the South. Brave woman. You have done your people and mine a service which can never be weighed nor measured if American conscience were only half alive, if the American church and clergy were only half Christianized, the American moral sensibility were not hardened by persistent infliction, outrage, and crime against colored people. A scream of horror, shame, and indignation would rise. Yours truly, Frederick Douglass. In 1893, I embarked upon taking the anti lynching to England because of my good friend, Frederick Douglass, connecting me with Catherine Impey. A Quaker who embraced me, who sympathized with the cause. It was during this time I also challenged Francis Willard. Why? Why had she not seen and come out and spoken against lynching, saying that the Negro man was a threat against the white woman. My speaking engagement in England was my first. I was shy, but they welcomed me. Thank you so much. It is indeed an honor that your country has embraced me. My lecture, America's National Crime, is lynching. It is not the creature of an hour, the sudden outbursts of uncontrolled furor, or the unspeakable brutality of an insane mob. It represents the cool, calculating deliberation of intelligent people 
who openly avow that there is an unwritten law. The unwritten law first found excuse with the rough, rugged, and determined man who left the civilized centers of the eastern states to seek for quick returns in the gold fields of the west. It next appeared in the south where centuries of Anglo-Saxon civilization had made effective all the safeguards of court procedure. Under the authority of a national law that gave every citizen the right to vote, the newly made citizens should choose to exercise suffrage. But the reign of the national law was short-lived and illusionary, for you see, it had hardly, the sentences had dried upon the pages before lynching had continued in the southern states under a cry against Negro domination proclaimed that there was an unwritten law. The alleged minutes of universal suffrage having been avoided by the absolute suppression of the Negro vote, the spirit of mob murder should have been satisfied and the butchery of Negroes should have ceased. However, men, women, and children of the Negro race were killed for disputing over terms of contracts. If a few bonds were burned, some colored man was killed to stop it. If a colored man resented the, the imposition of white man and the two came to blows, the colored man had to die. For you see, in America, the unwritten law continued to stand and all the Negro asks is justice, a fair and impartial trial in the courts of the country that given he will abide. It is with these last words that I leave you with that for the love of country, no American travels abroad without blushing for shame for his country on this subject. The United States should be placed speedily on the plane of confessing herself a failure at self-government. This cannot be until every American of every section broadest patriotism and best and wisest citizenship not only see the defect of our country's armor, but take the necessary steps to remedy it. Thank you very much. Thank you. After making that speech, I was able to establish the British Anti-Lynching Committee. But once again, the American public was not kind to me, for they said, Nasty, nasty, slanderous, malotrous with her words. This did not deter me from my fight. For you see, I was on a mission. And I knew that if I kept my mouth shut, it would not happen. Returning in 1893, it was the World's Fair in Chicago. And Frederick Douglass and my newly found friend, Bernadine Barnett, he was a widowed attorney, joined me in my fight on why is the colored excluded and not included at the World's Fair? You grab the Haitians, but there is not a colored booth 
we should have color day. Well, the colored bourgeois. They will determine, oh no, we will have no part of this. Why are we making lights of ourselves if we are about integration? And the Negro press, they said we should have color day. So a delegation went to the administration of the fair and they decided to have color day. I was against it because this was not integration. My friend and benefactor, Frederick Douglass, well, he was determined to speak. And a good white man decided to hand out watermelon to all the colored folk. <laughs> well, Frederick Douglass went to the booth. August 25th was colored day. And he was determined to speak on the race problem in America. <laughs> well, he had his speech in his hand, got up, was ready to speak, and they heckled him. He threw his speech down and said, we don't have a Negro problem. The problem is the American people need to have enough loyalty, enough patriotism to honor the Constitution of the United States. <laughs> I tell you, <laughs> he was something. He took a stand. <laughs> we didn't like it, but he did it. I was invited many times to Susan B. Anthony's home to there to talk about the colored woman standing back as we look at the suffrage movement. We must have debated from supper to midnight. Huh? Why the colored woman should stand back and let the white woman go ahead for the expediency of suffrage. Well, I told her, you know, nine years ago at the conference in New Orleans, you all refused to have the colored women. And if you abide by not including us, it's just going to confirm the segregation. <laughs> she laughs. laughs. In 1895, I published the red record. It was a quantitative data, that investigative reporting that the idea of rape and criminal behavior was not so connected to lynching as it was to keep the Negro down. <laughs> now for a long time, I didn't think much of marriage. I had a lot of suitors, mind you, but I did not want to give in to a man. That was until I met Bernadine Barnett. <laughs> he was a widowed, a race man, an attorney who didn't mind me doing what I was doing. I must have put him off three times for my speaking engagement. What man do you know would wait on a woman that long? <laughs> but he did. And we were married 1895 at the age of 33 at Bethel Baptist Church in Chicago. And the New York Times, they read, they ran an article. Miss Ida B. Wells, the colored woman who gained international publicity by her anti-lynching lectures in England, was married in Bethel tonight to Fernandan L. Barnett, a local colored attorney of prominence who is the publisher of the Conservator and is president of the Illinois Anti-Lynching League. Oh, it was a day over 500 inside and out wanted to be there and afterwards because of my identity i hyphenated my name 
That was a first, especially back then in those days. <laughs> Wells Barnett. <laughs> and Ferner Dan went along with it. He said it was legal. <laughs> I continued to write for our paper, the conservator, and others. And in 1896, I established a natural association of colored women group, lifting as we climb, focusing on social reform and suffrages. Also during this time, because of the lynchings that continued all over the South, we started the first civil rights movement, the National African American Council. We focus on passing a federal anti-lynching law and regularly would meet with President William McKinney. In 1895, Frederick Douglass, my friend, died of a heart attack shortly after a speech in Washington, D.C. at the National Council of Women. I part, pardon myself for a minute of working, but I soon got back. And in 1900, I published The Mob Rules in New Orleans, a account of the lynchings that continued. I wanted justice. I wanted the good people of the United States to see what was going on and join with me in fighting lynching. I was called a bull in a china shop because I was blunt. I always voiced my opinion. They said I was not respectful. And one time I was not respectful was to Booker T. Washington. <laughs> he wanted the Negro to do work, labor, industrial education. And so I was criticized by everyone when I published in the conservator Booker T. Washington and critics. I'll read an excerpt for industrial education for the Negro is Booker T. Washington's hobby. He believes that the masses of Negro race and elementary education, the brain and a continuation of the education of the hand is the only way best. But he knows it is most popular with white South. He also knows that the Negro is the butt of ridicule with the average white Americans and that aforesaid Americans enjoy nothing so much as a joke which portrays a Negro as illiterate, improvident, a petty thing, or a happy-go-lucky inferior. Now, we have colored universities they have given us thousands of our teachers for our schools, physicians, druggists, lawyers, and ministers, that one of the most noted of our race, Booker T, should join with the enemies to their highest progress and condemning the education they received has been a bitter pill. The gospel of work is no new one for the Negro. It is South's oldest slavery practice. In a new dress, it was only the education that the South gave the Negro for two and a half centuries. The Negro that knows it and continues in this way will be oppressed. Mr. Washington's reply to his critics is that he does not oppose higher occasion and of offers in proof of this statement that his Negro faculty, however, does this mean that the Negro objects to industrial education? By no means. It simply means he knows by sad experience that industrial education will not stand him in place of political 
civil and intellectual liberty. Shortly after I delivered that, the new face of the leader of the colored was Booker T. Washington. Why was I not chosen? I was the foremost. Was it because I had little education? Was it because of my mouth? Was it colorism that existed in my own race? I didn't let it hold me down. I continued. I gave a speech at the Negro Conference in June of 1909 about the lynching to share with you one brief excerpt. The only remedy is an appeal to the law. Lawbreakers know that human life is sacred and every citizen of the country is first a citizen of the United States and secondly, a citizen in the state in which he belongs. The practical remedy has been more than once suggested in Congress. Senator Gallinger of New Hampshire in a resolution introducing Congress called for an investigation with the view of ascertaining whether there is a remedy for lynching which Congress may apply. His final word, it would be a beginning in the right direction if at this conference we see a way to establish a bureau of investigation and publication of every details of lynching. They refused. And shortly after, the Niagara Movement, where W.E.B. Du Bois, the intellectual of our time, and 40 others concluded that we should not be lobbying against lynching. There are other things that come forth. From that Niagara came the NAACP, which I was one of the founders, but my name was omitted. Once again, was it because of my education, because of my mouth? So I reside in Chicago. I became a probation officer, and because of the great migration of Negroes to Chicago, I saw the need for help for the Negro man and child. And every Thursday night, I had a Bible study. And I began to seek financial support for establishing the Negro Fellowship League and Lighthouse, which had a reading room and social center for Negro men and boys. I couldn't get any support from the well-to-do Negroes, so I worked by day as a probation officer, and in the evening, you'd find me at the Lighthouse teaching those how to read, and so forth. I had a vision, and I was going to continue it. It was in 1913, the Illinois state gave women the right to vote in local and national elections. And in January, with the help of Bell Squire and Virginia Brooks, I started the Alpha Suffrage Club. The goal was to make the colored woman more comfortable in politics and use it as an advantage to our race. Well, in 1913, in March of that year, 
Alice Paul decided to do a protest to coincide with Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. The women's suffrage, all of the women from across the nation would be there. And so the alpha suffrage, we were going to join the Illinois group. We are here and we were there. We were there to march with the Illinois delegation. However, Bell Squire, my friend, told me that they want all of the colored folks to march in the back. I politely told them, I march with you all or I don't march at all. I'm not doing this for the benefit of my recognition. I'm doing this for the benefit of my race. Well, Belle and the others went to talk to the Southerners. And the Southern women, they didn't want us to join. They were the root cause of this all. Well, I was not going to march with the colored women. So when they came back and said they had not changed their mind, I left the parade only to return when the Illinois delegation came alongside my friend, Bell Squire. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Her truth is marching on. The Chicago Tribune, <laughs> they reported on it and they said, Mrs. Barnett joined with her friend, Miss Squire, and went down Pennsylvania Avenue. Without a hitch, the march went on. I had to stand up. I wanted to march with my white sisters. We do it together or we fail. Yes. <laughs> the suffrage group went on in Illinois to canvas every neighborhood in the second ward. <laughs> and the men, they jeered us and said, y'all ought to be home with the babies out here carrying on. We signed up over 7,293 women, enough to make the politicians listen. We elected our first Negro alderman. The Alfred Suffrage Club had over 500 members. We were going to reform the second ward. And Oscar de Priest, our first alderman, was going to help us. I saw the inadequacies with the schooling in Chicago. And I set out with the Board of Education to establish the first kindergarten for colored children. In 1914, I was labeled a race agitator. <laughs> but it didn't stop me from working with Marcus Garvey, Madam C.J. Walker, and Monroe Trotter. I continued to investigate the lynchings that went on in Houston, Chicago. And in 1920, my beloved lighthouse had to close down. But that same year, the 19th Amendment. And once again, the colored woman Depending on the state, the black codes, if we could vote or 
could not. I investigated in 1922 the Elaine murders, the lynching in Arkansas, 12 sharecroppers who were put on death row because they wanted equal treatment. And the farmers, the white farmers, there was a fight and they went through the area of a lane and burned down over 30 homes and killed 30 Negroes. Walter White with the NAACP, because of his color, was able to get in. They thought he was white, man. I went down to investigate. First time I had been in the South in over 30 years. And I told them, why are you going to give up? You done made it this far. Let's fight for justice. And they were acquitted. I ran for Illinois State Senate in 1930. I lost, but a legacy was won for colored women. I started writing my autobiography and thinking. My story will never be told. They have excluded me. They have not included me in the table with my own people. But I want you all to remember me as the crusader for justice. Thank you. Thank you all, my distinguished guests and friends, for listening to my story. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Early on, there was scheduled to be a meeting. However, when she came out against Willard, because she was revered, it did not happen. It was scheduled, but the English loved Frances Willard. And when she came out publicly about her, um, a lot of the elite and the crown had to turn away because of their relationships with the United States at that time. Yes. Quite often, I saw this as after the losing my parents at 16, my friend Tommy Moss, life was there, but I knew in a minute it could be snatched. So the fear existed, but I continued. Any other questions for uh, Ida B. Wells? Okay. Yes. How do you feel your impact was in regards to the player against you? Feel that that changed by any way? I do believe there were those who followed me, who began to become enlightened. However, because there were those within my own race 
that would not take a stand. It was very challenging. There were times when I felt to no avail, but I had within my heart that push, that motivation from where I had come from, who I was, what my father and mother had gone through, what I had seen happen, that I was determined. Yes. There were women. There was one woman in particular that I investigated for being sassy. There was a 14-year-old boy and girl. Well, the boy was 14 and she was 12 because their father, they were looking for their father and they would not give that information. So they lynched them and then went on to lynch their father. This happened in Arkansas. Any other questions, Ida? Yes. Did your family support what you were doing? My husband was very supportive. He had been married before. And so for the most part, he took a back seat to my, to his career and joined with me and my uh, four children. They also joined later. I was very disappointed in my son, Herman, who began gambling. He was an attorney like his father, but he began gambling. And my Christian morals kept me straight. And I prayed daily for him, but that was a vice that he never, never got rid of. Well, if we don't have any other questions for Ida B. Wells, I'm going to have to uh, get my information here. Um, uh, Rebecca Marks Jimerson is the researcher and the actor that has been portraying her. And I want to say she's also, not she's done, she's an actress and she sings. Uh, she's... Uh, also has been involved with the Greenwood Chamber of Commerce, and she brought along with her all these artifacts back there that if you haven't looked at, those are things that have survived, did survive the Tulsa Rates Massacre. And she, when we're all done, she could spend time talking to you about that. And if we have any questions for her at this point, uh, yes. Because she can answer lots of questions as well. Now's yes. the time to ask them. Please, I can be myself now. Oh, no, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have a question just about sort of how you developed, how you present Ida as a character. Like, what were your resources for that? You know, being a... a a theater person, as I say, I, I tend to want to delve off into that period with people that I know. I mean, coming on the plane, I heard some women, uh, as my dad used to say in the church, uh, had this cat call laugh, <laughs> these women. And it brought back that Negro church of which I was raised in late, you know, as a little kid, I remember my mother played the piano and, you know, that those type of instances of drawing on the experiences and actually interviewing. I interviewed several, I interviewed the 108-year-old survivor of Greenwood, Lessie uh, Benningfield Randall, uh, several of my um, father's old friend. I was, as I say, my mom had me at 48. So I have sisters, four older sisters that all in, the, in their, you know, my mother passed at 14. So I could somewhat identify 
with this. And so having those 14, four older sisters, and by the way, they've called me 10 times. What are you doing up in Keene? You know, they're in use and here and there. You know, you're the, I'm the baby sister. What are you, you should be over there in the character, okay? To draw on what my father's life was. I mean, my mother had me 48, had all these older kids. And then here, here's baby Ruth. Oh, my goodness. She's a handful. You know, so my older sisters who her husband's Vietnam vet and like she's down there. What are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. Keith hadn't told you my husband. You should be going all around. There she is again on the road. But this is a part of who I am. And so I would look back at my father. He was a World War II vet. His parents came to Oklahoma before statehood. And because right now, um, having from a family of 15 and they worked in the field, my father, he said he put his age up to um, past 16 so he can go to World War II. And he taught himself to read the Bible. I mean, so all of this kind of fit and all he could know is, oh, all of you got to get education. You know, my, I have a sister that's a doctor, you know what I mean? The analytical, that middle child who's always, you know what I mean? Of, of me, the youngest, blah, 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 what are you doing? But it evolved in somewhat, as I read it, of I could see connections, but she was so determined that it was almost, in some cases, to a fault, that she would not give up. She did not care if, if, if she was ostracized. She did not care that she didn't have the education. And I'm just thinking of placing her today where she would be in prefaces of, of circles. And so it, it took me about a year to actually get the character and being that I am a former educator and I adjunct teach now all the communication class, the classes you hate to teach, okay, <laughs> that I enjoy it, but I also draw on my people experiences. Thank you. I do. I do. Yes. Um, as, as I was sharing with Gail um, on the Scholarly side, Harriet Tubman, um, Coretta Scott King, and a, a favorite, Madam C.J. Walker, and Lessie Randall, who was the 107, eight-year-old uh, Greenwood. Okay, and then on the fun side, uh, I, I do uh, some collections of, of, of people that you say, oh my goodness, these are the, kind of off the wall. <laughs> I'd love to come, okay? <laughs> Everybody likes Keen. <laughs> Any other questions? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. She was close, but she was disappointed with them because um, they did not, they were not as forward in the civil rights movement as she was. Like Alfreda, the one who took up her um, biography, because she actually stopped mid-sentence on writing her biography. Hmm. So I, I don't, you know, I don't know what happened. And I was trying to find out as I made some trips to Chicago on what happened. And Alfreda... Um, and now her granddaughter is involved, you know, because, you know, she got the Pulitzer and so forth. If it had not been for um, women scholars, she still would have been somewhat forgotten. Because when we think of uh, Negro History Month, she's not included. She was not included in Negro history. You know, I didn't I didn't really know about her until late, you know, didn't, didn't know. So um, they, to this day, um, they have children, they have children now, but they never really came to the forefront and as powerful as she was. 
And I think she was a very staunch, I mean, just she was one of those that I'd run away from at church. Because <laughs> they always wanted you to sit on the front row and I'd be on the back row. Mm, I'm not doing it. Okay, chewing gum or something. You know? So she was the epitome of that type that, you know, when you pass by, come here, you. So uh, she was um, a challenging woman, I'd say. So I think then, if you don't have any other questions, I'm going to ask you, there's an evaluation here that I would love it if you filled out, and you can tell me some ideas of future programs, but also since um, the program, the, you know, the honorariums, and the, that came about through this grant that I have to report on, and also we did get some extra equipment. So you, if you do follow us on social media or um, YouTube, you'll be able to look and soon we'll have this up so you can watch it again. You can tell your friends to um, watch it. And one more thing, if I might have a couple of books left over, there was a few books of um, Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery and there's a kid's book about Ida B. Wells. If anybody would like to take those, you're welcome to do that. Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, we probably some more pie and brownies as well. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Thank you.